This is Twit. Uh, so the story we've got here is that Firefox is ending 32-bit, but uh, we could talk for a little bit about some of the reasons why distros are dropping the 64-bit, or excuse me, dropping the 32-bit support as well. Um, there, there are some security hardening things that landed in the processors in 64-bit. And so like it was true for the longest time that running 64-bit Windows was a lot more secure than 32-bit. Uh, and I believe some of that is the same in Linux as well, where you have you know, these, these different uh, processor features like being able to mark RAM as non-executable. I think that's a 64-bit feature only. Um, so the story, again, the story that we have here is that Firefox is not going to ship 32, the 32-bit browser after version 144. And they're saying it's time for users of Firefox to switch to 64-bit systems. So that's September of 2026. You've got a full year to uh, upgrade your old, old 32-bit systems. Um, but starting with Firefox 145 coming out in 2026, uh, it will be 64 bits only. And so, yes, there's a security component to this. It's also just true that with fewer people using 32-bit and the continuing sort of um, lack of distro support, lack of testing on it, it's becoming more and more of a maintenance burden. And Firefox is sort of having to batten down the hatches and trim up, uh, tighten the belt up to be able to try to stay afloat. Um, we did get some news this week that is good for Fire, good for Mozilla, and good for Firefox, um, and we could talk about that here in a minute too. But uh, yeah, if you're still running 32-bit Firefox or even just a 32-bit Linux, uh, you've got uh, it's 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 time to move on to 64-bit. Come come taste the 64-bit goodness. <laughs> so when well, will we see 120 128-bit architectures? Uh, probably not going to happen because well, we already have 512 bit architectures actually in, in, yeah, in the ultra wide. Yeah, they just the GPUs they, and stuff. well, in, C, in CPUs, there are the AVX 512 extensions, right? You could make an argument that we are actually running 512 bit CPUs. Um, now, that would be arbitrary, but since when has the labeling of CPUs not been arbitrary and sort of silly? True. <laughs> but I mean, it, true. Uh, back when they were all 8 bit. No, it true. was still arbitrary and silly back then. Let's be real. Yeah. True, true. 512, though. I mean, you like graphics cards and some of those kind of things, which are CPUs, basically, just specialized. Mm -hmm. And they're running the wide, wide paths. It, you know, 32 to 64 was a big jump. So you can support a lot more memory, things like that. Going beyond that, there's not really a big advantage unless you're moving a ton of data and and there's still ways kind of around it now that you mm -hmm. know systems support i don't know even exabytes of ram and i don't know what kind of ites they got for the drives but it's big you know mm -hmm. and so you so i don't i don't I expect to sick we're going to stay on 64 but Linux, you know, and a lot of those, the software companies want to start really flushing out 32-bit because there's a lot of cruft in there. And the hardware companies, we've talked about this before, Intel, AMD, a lot of them, they want to get rid of the 32-bit because things aren't as standardized as they are in 64. 64, things are a lot cleaner and more organized, but 32, uh, especially 16, saw a whole lot of kludges and stuff, you know, taped and bailing wired together 32 still had some of that and 64 is running a lot cleaner so they want to if they clean that up simplifies the hardware simplifies the software thing things are uh, more efficient mm -hmm. they don't need so many transistors they can make them more power efficient less uh, attack surface for coders because you don't have to support so many different uh, architectures and you know, oh, this is 32, quick drop to this other code. And, you know, it, it just cleans everything up. Yeah, yeah. Um, I want to touch base again on that idea of 120 bit, 128 bit processor. Um, there are two, like, so when you talk about the bit width of a processor, there's sort of two different things that you could be talking about. Like one is your memory width of your internal uh, registers, how wide those are. And so like we said, 
modern systems ha- actually have some 512 bit registers, right? They can do they can do these AVX 512. So from that perspective, one could refer to them as a 512 bit CPU. But the other thing that that bit width usually refers to is the address bus. Like how wide is the memory address bus? And uh, like so, and that determines how much memory you can address on the system. With 32 bit systems, we were limited to four gigabytes. With a 64 bit system, we are limited to 16 exabytes of memory. And it's, I, I had to look this up to even wrap my head around how big an exabyte was. So we went from four gigabytes, the next one, a thousand gigabytes is a terabyte. A thousand terabytes is a petabyte, and a thousand petabytes is an exabyte. So we are a long, long ways away from running out of memory address space uh, to to need more than 16 exabytes of addressable bits. <laughs> I'm just proud yeah. I got my ITs correct. Ah, you know it off the top of your head. Yeah. I, well, I, I, was, I was guessing because I'm like, I'm pretty sure it's bigger than petabytes because I, I knew giga, tera, peta, and I'm like, I think the next one's exa. And then after that, I don't know. Yeah. So you don't think this pursuit of AI isn't going to exceed that 64-bit addressing? No, 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 not not anytime soon. I mean, how much how much memory is in the biggest supercomputer? Um, I don't. Do you don't have know. enough memory to hold all the data that's been scraped in that? address well you don't you don't have to hold all of it at once is the thing um and th- that's what that's sort of the, the 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 way modern ai works one of the breakthroughs is that they figured out how to effectively distill those huge huge amounts of data into tokens that can fit in a much smaller amount of space uh El Capitan apparently is top the the top system. Uh, blah, 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 blah. AMD twenty four cores HPE. Uh, come on, just tell me how much memory it has. <laughs> it's got eight million cores. Uh, I'll find it. Yeah, well, the thing too is, if you said, "Okay, we're we're going to put in sixteen exabytes of RAM." And now I'm just totally pulling this number out of thin air. I, I can't say for sure, but I mean, that's probably the entire output of a fab for like a week or a couple of weeks, maybe a month. I mean, just the <clears throat> the sheer volume of chips you'd have to have would just be enormous. Yeah. Okay. Time to so go with a base here's, space-based here's, fab and then put the uh, data center in space too. I am very skeptical of that idea. I will just say, but uh, I will not be surprised if build it in space becomes the next buzzword and bubble, but I am still skeptical that the math ever works out on that. Okay, back to this. El Capitan has 5.4 petabytes of high bandwidth memory, and that that is petabytes. The maximum in 64-bit addressing is exabytes, so you could build a machine a thousand times bigger than the number one top supercomputer out there right now, El Capitan. And it, you would still be able to double it before you ran out of address space. <laughs> yeah, it, it's just, you, you would literally have semi after semi, semi of just modules to, yeah. to have that. Yeah, it's it's a it's a lot. It is very big. So I, we're waiting for the uh, the fabs to get to where they can do. Uh, what's next one below nanometers? <laughs> but uh, Intel, you're, you're Intel not really going to get there. About the the angstrom, isn't it? It's isn't the that, angstrom. Yeah, that's that's their new thing, so that they can make their uh, fab revs seem like a bigger deal than they are. Nan- nano is to the minus ninth angstrom is the minus 10th mm-hmm. but you start getting to the point where you're running into molecular uh sizes so you're using molecules that are a certain size you can only get so small you can't 
it's not infinitely scalable because you're like, well, my copper atom has a size of X. I, I can't shrink it. I, and I need X number of them to make a circuit. You know, you, you can't just string one and then another to have reliable. So you're going to have to have a few layers there and it, you just, you just run out of size that because yeah. originally they talked about Moore's law running out a roughly around um, 20, I think it was about 2020 mm -hmm. because that was where your, your shrinkage. Now you got to start doing things like you're going, that's why you see things from like two dimensions going into three dimensions because they're, they're shrinking the size, but they've got to stack it higher because you just run into physics limits. Mm -hmm. And then physics steps in by, transferring that electrical power to heat power, <laughs> making yeah. it melt. <laughs> One of the problems. Right. That that's something too. But I mean you but that and then you're dealing with lower and lower voltages because you're trying to avoid that heat and that energy. That's mm -hmm. why, you know, the old TTL logic, you're like, oh, zero to five volts. Now it's like, oh, you're sub sub volts yeah. just to make it all work and go fast enough and and then you get slew rates coming in with that and it you know it, there, there's a lot of physics that complicated electrical engineering stuff if you enjoyed this clip be sure to check out the untitled linux show you can find us in your favorite podcasting app or subscribe to our youtube channel down in the links below see you there mm -hmm.